Hi, everyone. Uh, today we have a chat with Dustin Miller from Poly Innovator. I'm uh, really excited to talk with uh, Dustin today because uh, Dustin is a well, Poly Matt, and uh, he has been running a podcast for the longest time. Uh, and I've been listening to a lot of them, and they are fascinating, I must say. Uh, it's uh, You have really interesting guests on. And what I find most interesting is really how you create a conversation that inspires people to learn and discover and explore the world. Personally, I'm a person that wants to learn really everything about everything. And I'm curious uh, to you, what does being a polymath mean to you? And do you see yourself as a polymath first and all? Well, thank you for having me. I'm Dustin Poly Innovator or Dustin Miller Poly Innovator, however you want to call me. But I consider that name to be, that Poly Innovator name to be more important than my actual name. And I bring that up because the actual term itself is something I created. And I think it's related to your question quite deeply. It is essentially the polymath of innovation. I'm The key is innovation. I want to innovate different areas of life and the world mm. and that kind of thing. And while polymaths inherently are innovative, I just wanted to focus on that. A polymath itself is someone who is an expert in three or more areas. Now, defining a polymath is something that a lot of researchers have been trying to do and like figure out what really makes up one. But the easiest idea is that you love to learn, you are multidisciplinary, and you are deeply knowledgeable. Not just like, oh, jack of all trades or journalist level, but you're deeply knowledgeable. While yeah. some people have called me a polymath, and I definitely take that as a compliment, I definitely want to become one. I don't necessarily know if I would call myself one. In fact, what I've been taking to is calling myself a proto-polymath, if, if you will. Mm. Because it takes a journey. It takes a while to become one. It takes a bit while to become an expert in anything. And I've mm. taught swimming for a decade. I actually taught a swim lesson this morning. And I realized just how deeply knowledgeable I am in that area. I could consider myself an expert in that. Same with content creation. I've been doing it almost as long as swimming. Uh, podcasting for half that long, even, too. Blocking's been around a decade. So there's a lot of areas I could consider myself an expert in, but I just call myself a proto-polymath. Yeah, I think what you're touching on here is uh, quite an interesting question in itself, like how much you need to study to be considered an expert in a field. And what I notice is a lot of experts suffer from um, yeah, imposter syndrome or a lot of doubt in regard to, you know, can I consider myself an expert? I've only been studying this for 20 years, you know, <laughs> so much more to learn, you know. So it's uh, like a question of like, uh, what's the difference between being a jack of all trades and being a polymath? And like, yeah, how do you see that for yourself? So I actually created what I call the multidisciplinary spectrum. And I really think it's helpful for a lot of people, especially people listening to this podcast, for example, because if you identify yourself as someone who's a jack of all trades or multi-potentialite, where do you go from there? How do you level up to polymath? And it's a matter of how much knowledge you have and how many areas of knowledge. So a specialist may be this one area of knowledge very deeply. A generalist might be more medium level, but wide. And then you have some kind of middle grab between there, like the Renaissance person or the jack of all trades being a little bit lower. But there's also the T-shaped person who is a specialist with a wide base, that kind of thing. And so right. I consider myself along the lines of a middle ground, kind of in the middle of that spectrum, leveling up to polymath. And that's where I create mm. a lot of content around too. It's this journey of becoming a polymath. Right. And I know you have a bit of a tech focus uh, as well, because you've been diving into and you actually got to be really inspired as well in this area. Um, uh, I know that you worked with uh, AutoGPT and with Obsidian and with like special tools. Like, So the question is, like, to which extent today is it possible to learn everything uh, about everything and to be an expert in all areas? And to which extent do we need tools uh, and like these kinds of tools to facilitate the process? Oh, I'm so glad you asked this question because I was wondering how I'm going to fit this in. Literally, right before this call, I was diving into AGI, like they use this this generate this general intelligence, that kind of thing, and artificial general intelligence, and honest, honestly, too, just how to implement that in my own personal knowledge management system as well. Notion came out with this AI feature, but it's very rudimentary and basic, whereas Obsidian, which is a tool that's more for note-taking and synergizing ideas, has a lot of plugins to integrate with ChatGPT, which was much more powerful personal AI. While I haven't played so much with those plugins just yet because privacy, I have been playing around with like AutoGPT and HGPT. There's actually one recently called Proximity, I think, that came out. That's really fascinating as well. So I've been playing around with seeing how powerful these AI models can become. 
and how mm. I could interrelate that with my own personal documents and create my own Jarvis like system. And that's something I've been really nerding out about. So I have 50 tabs open right now, actually, about like trying to learn. Yeah, just hearing that, that you have a lot of tabs open, you're constantly learning, you're studying everything. Uh, a lot of my viewers are really interested in the 16 personalities, the MBTI, and uh, just personal types in general. I think they're very curious, just uh, how would you describe yourself? Uh, and uh, yeah, have you taken an MBTI test? And uh, yeah. how do you look at your personality? Well, we should definitely touch back on that last question because I didn't finish answering, I don't think, the like learning everything kind of idea, but we could touch on that later. When it comes to personality-wise, the last time I took the test, I was an ENFP, but I wonder if I've definitely become more of a thinker too rather than a feeler just because of, I don't know, becoming more of a hermit, being more isolated, focusing on myself more over the past decade or so. And so I'm wondering how that changes. I know your personality can change actually as we age as well. There's some of the studies have shown like people can become more introverted versus extroverted based on their time of their life and their habits and their lifestyle. It's something that's really fascinating to me as well. Yeah, because uh, in the MTI spectrum, we talk a lot about extroverted intuition being the function that is always about like continuous learning and the, uh, sharing ideas, brainstorming, thinking of alternatives, things you could do. Uh, and different uh, ideas in general. Have you looked into or thought about like your own thought process and how you tend to like make decisions and how you tend to move between these things? I really like that question and it's probably going to get me thinking about it more and more, ironically, after this call probably too. But I think that how I te teach and how I think happens to come from a lot of different sources. So I try mm -hmm. to think about it in the sense of swimming, for example. I was teaching somebody this morning, a friend of mine, and I explained it like this. Some people need the physics, some people need the psychology, some people need the philosophy. Everyone has their anchor. I just, as a teacher, have to find what anchor that person has. Everybody needs all three, but everyone learns yeah. best in that moment based on just one of those. So my friend this morning, he needed physics. He needed to know how to do it, and that was how he learned, and so that's how I communicated. Right. So that sounds like uh, you're taking a bit of a cognitive flexibility approach in a sense, like you adjust your behavior a lot to the situation and the person you're talking to. Uh, would you say it's easy for you to switch your language as well, depending on yeah. like who you're talking with? Yeah, I. It's, it's funny, code switching is something I really like doing, especially when it comes to maybe like cultures or stuff like that. While I don't necessarily speak multiple languages just yet, I do speak Spanish pretty well. I can identify languages pretty well. I was walking past uh, a couple dudes talking the other day and I realized they, this is this, like they're like 50 feet away. I could tell they were speaking Arabic even from that distance. The other day I was at a public place and this mom and daughter came around me and they were speaking French. I know they able to identify that despite the fact I barely know any French. So just being able to identify the situations when it comes to actual languages, let alone code switching when it comes to how to approach a certain person or interact with that person. Yeah. They uh, recently said that uh, they did a study on uh, gifted people and people with higher intelligence. And they saw that uh, these people tend to lie about their personality a lot. Or they, <laughs> well, in a sense, when they take personality tests uh, for work, for example, they will just answer exactly what their employee or employer yeah. wants them to think in a sense. So a lot of the time, it seems like they have a pretty fluid personality in general. You should say that to me. <laughs> uh, I also thought uh, it was interesting because uh, you have this tech focus and this innovation focus. I'm curious, like, what do you get your motivation from? Uh, do you get your motivation from solving the problems, just figuring out how things work and learning about the technology? Or do you have a more ethical or social concerns as well like in a sense of like are you trying to uh help people in some way through this or like to make the world a better place to, in some way through these tools i mean the question you were asking seemed kind of macro and kind of big picture i'm not exactly sure depending on the context where my motivation would come from in general i have that kind of nurse north star kind of pool where i have a certain goal in mind whether that's Poly innovator or beyond poly innovator, which is a whole other rabbit hole. But essentially speaking, everything I do goes towards that goal. I've worked two or three jobs at a time just so I can go home and work on poly innovator, for example. Even mm. though I was burned out and tired from work, I was fueled to work on what I was doing. At that time, I was working on my, one of my first websites and trying to get some content out and just barely starting. Nowadays, yeah. it's one of those things where the past two weeks I've been working on my city in Vault and having to move everything thousands of files manually from notion 
and it's been a monumental task. I just got done a couple of days ago, and yet I still have a lot more challenges ahead of me. A lot of plugins I thought were going to work are no longer working. I'm actually, most people would probably lose hope, but I literally just went to sleep, tried to work on it the next day when I was nice and fresh. Yeah, that's a thing in general. Like people just give up if they hit into a wall, right? But the question is like, uh, what do you do when your motivation is at zero when you work yourself to an overwhelm? You've been thinking about something for a really long time and you have no idea how to do something. Like what what uh, what is your like uh, go-to strategy in those situations? Is it just go to sleep and try again the next day or is there something more to it? I mean, if you look at like Einstein, for example, he would go, I guess, lay on a boat, start the sky in the middle of a lake when he was frustrated by a problem. Mm -hmm. And so, for yeah. example, I, the other night I, had, I was frustrated, I went to sleep. I could tell that part of the reason why I was frustrated is that I was lacking energy and lacking any kind of like fuel for my brain. I had ate, I had taken caffeine, I had done all the basic kind of supplemental stuff, but I needed to refuel my brain from sleeping. I actually had to go rest. Sometimes I'd meditate, yeah. something like that. The other night I was working on moving things over and I had maybe four or 500 files left over. And it was just a process of just, you have to do it. There's no way to accelerate this. There's no way to just like cheat it. I had to just do it piece by piece by piece by piece by piece. And I just did it. I, yeah. I, it was like 1 a.m. And I remember being, or maybe midnight until 1 a.m. I remember being frustrated. Like, I just want to do this tomorrow. I want to get it done later on. I want to push it away. It's like, no, if you get it done now, you can be really happy. And I just push through it. I don't know if I have answered your question. Yeah, it does. I feel a lot of the time I thought about like, what is it that my superpower is? Or like, what is the thing that I can do? Like, and what is my main skill, right? And uh, one answer that I came up with was uh, I can just steal myself to stay focused on a task for an infinite amount of time, right? In a sense, like if I like, yeah, I can just continuously push through in a task and just keep going at it forever, basically. But uh, mm -hmm. the older I've gotten, like the more I've learned, like how important it is to be a bit nuanced with that. Because, uh, for example, nowadays, like since last year, uh, basically I was noticing like the warning signs of burnout, like putting on too much, mm -hmm. getting too overwhelmed by everything, trying to take on too much, and uh, also starting to notice the hit the wall at my desk job in the sense of like working a forty-hour job on top of managing a YouTube community and everything else, right? So. I uh, started uh, going out a lot more into nature, right? So I ended up like creating like these uh, uh, honestly really strange like routines in a sense of, uh, yeah, I, I, I can spend up to four hours out in a day, uh, day because I need that recharge space and I take a lot of breaks, right? So mm -hmm. it's happening to me that I don't work you know the nine to five clock thankfully my work is quite flexible so it's quite easy for me to you know if i want a two-hour lunch walk to take a two-hour lunch walk all as it all comes down to like how much mental capacity do i feel that i have at that time to solve that problem and how do i get myself if i run out of fuel how do i get myself back to 100 percent right it's when i try to go to walks too but not two hours <laughs> 12 minutes is usually <laughs> sufficient to get the mental kind of clarity and uh neurochemicals and going but two hours probably really gets you going i think probably really resets you yeah it's uh often i invented this cycle uh thing where i like i bring my notes with me so i walk uh until i have inspiration and then i sit down and write and as soon as i've written down everything I walk more so that way i can keep myself in a continuous like research and learning and writing mode so that's somehow it's working for me because now i'm running four youtube channels at the same time <laughs> on uh, different topics publishing two videos a day or a week on each channel uh, while also running my blog while also having my job <laughs> and while also uh, working with other clients and doing coaching so well, it's and that's somehow it too. works <laughs> It's like managing all that different stuff. So for example, I have a swimming newsletter on Wednesday, content repurposing newsletter Thursday. I have my interviews. I try to do once a week. I try to do one episode at least of my polyene content, which is my main series. The polyene content is a blog post video and podcast in one. Each episode is all three. And that's I try to do one of those each week. And then on top of that, I actually am going to be starting my quote unquote main newsletter, despite the fact it's my third one around polymathy. I've I've done it sort of, but I hadn't made it a series just yet. But actually moving everything into Obsidian gave me a better perspective. And I was actually be able to kind of make a strategy for it. I didn't know what I wanted to do with it, but now I'll have that. And ironically, at some point down the line, I'm going to be doing a presumably AI generated newsletter around Obsidian. I think it's going to be a really cool project. Just as a little side thing. 
So I have multiple different series that I'm doing, plus the gaming channel each week. So I totally get what you're saying when you're managing all the different content everywhere. Yeah, it really comes down to like learn to do it sustainably. And a lot of the yeah. time, like with your newsletter, like I you'll have things in your head that you want to start on. Like I don't know if the same it's the same for you, but I have like a mental to-do list with like uh, 50 things that I have planned in and you know often i end up having to deal with such long time frames that it's like okay so next year in january i want to start with that project and then mm -hmm. after that i'm going to start picking up this so you kind of have to plan a lot right well and i just picked up a reminder plugin for obsidian because i was trying to find a way to plan out my content and none of the regular plugins for like project management would actually work with my huge system and I love how I'm looking at like a timesheet right now. It's just, okay, today I work on these two posts, tomorrow I work on this post, the next day I work on that post. And that's kind of how I'm able to clear out my brain. Because one thing I've learned that's really helpful is trying to clear your brain. Like don't try to keep things in your short-term memory because this is going to yeah. drain you. Try to mind dump as much as possible. And yeah. ironically, I've never had the issue of not coming up with ideas. Some people with consecration space, they're like, I don't know what to create this week or next week. I have the yeah. next... 50 weeks planned out for a lot of my series but it's one of those things where just getting around to doing them is has been the issue kind of like what you were saying earlier yeah i know like uh mr beast gave the advice if you don't have an idea for a video just open a lexicon you know and take the first yeah. word you see and make a video around that like okay. somehow like it's there's so many ideas like there are so many things you could do so from just uh getting getting uh perspective there there's no problem if you just ask around you'll figure out what to do but right. the question always come down to also prioritization right because a lot of my viewers also have issues with prioritization like they have lots of ideas but you know they don't know how to pick which mm -hmm. one should i focus on right which rabbit hole is i'm supposed to go down well and think of it like an equation this might help your viewers is that depending on how much time you have, like if you have a full-time job, you have very little time. But if you have two part-time jobs, maybe you'll have more time in the day or whatever, or how much time you have times how much energy you have, depending on if you're a spoonie or have health problems, you might not have as much energy. Perhaps if you don't have enough caffeine or enough sleep, you won't have enough energy. So times time times energy, plus the essential aspect of just how many things are you doing too. And so if you're trying to figure out that equation for your life and input your information, that might help you plan things out. And then you have to prioritize what things you're working on versus how much time you have. And then you just have to order order whichever ideas you have based on that. Yeah. So basically, like what I'm seeing is a lot of the time when people don't have a job as well, that can be like the, almost the biggest problem because then you think that you'd have so much time, right? So, but then I think it's almost the most easy to get overwhelmed in the sense of like, how do you get, uh, like suddenly you have all the time in the world and how do you choose? <laughs> like it's not, it's not all you can do, whatever you want almost. Well, and I don't remember the, the principal's t name, but there was a principle where it's basically your task will fill up how much time you allow it. So if you give yourself four hours, it'll take four hours. But if you give yourself just an hour, it'll take just an hour. And basically, mm -hmm. it just depends on how much time you give yourself to do that task. So if you have all day, if you give yourself all day to do a task, then you're going to spend all day. Like I'm actually facing that today where I have two posts that were supposed to be done more towards this morning, but I had a client and a meeting and another meeting after this. So I was like, okay, technically, I'm going to have to just kind of push those blog posts throughout any time of day. I'm giving myself the entire day to do it but I'm also kind of postponing and procrastinating and doing them. So it's kind of one of those balanced things there too. Yeah. The good thing that I'm starting to learn more and more is that it doesn't really matter when you post it as much anymore. Like it yeah. used to really matter, right? Like you had to do it at a certain amount of intervals and otherwise you'd lose your audience. But especially yeah. if we're doing evergreen content, like uh, it seems like you're also doing, you know, like technically your content is timeless. People can watch it three years from now and they can still value it, right? So. Mm -hmm. To some extent, it doesn't really matter. Like you can put it out tomorrow, you can put it out next week. So was, you have to set your own deadlines. Yeah, especially if it's evergreen. I was going through my old interviews and repurposing them. And I'm only doing my first phase of repurposing. I'm still gonna go through all my episodes personally and find find the quotes and clips manually just because I wanna I know my all the AI tools just don't understand my show very well. If it was a more simple show, then I might be able to use these tools more effectively. But they're getting a lot of clips and I'm realizing that even though a lot of my first 50 interviews have a lot of tangents about COVID, for example, because a lot of them are during 2020, yeah. even though it's a very timed and almost anti-evergreen 
subject, there's a lot of lessons that people talked about during that time, and it actually ended up being helpful three years later. So it's kind of interesting how, despite the fact that's an anti-evergreen subject, there's a lot of lessons that have learned that are evergreen. So I thought that was kind of helpful. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So I have a bit of a, uh, what you call it, the uh, uh, segue, <laughs> which is, um, uh, this weekend, I discovered this uh, library. Uh, it's called the Museum or uh, the Embassy of the Free Mind, and uh, it's uh, basically my dream place in Amsterdam at this point. Mm -hmm. It's uh, uh, a museum completely dedicated to the topic of alchemy, Taoism, Gnosticism, basically ancient wisdom, like all the history of ideas from humanity, from like the earliest text that we've been able to recover right mm. so it's basically just like for me it's like a pure candy store right so uh i discovered that on saturday i was there i went through the tour they showed me a private room and uh, nice. with a lot of secret books like uh so the next day i decided okay i'm gonna come back i'm just gonna go to back the next day because i can go there for free with my museum card uh, and uh, then uh, i just sat there the entire day and i just read all the books i could find and i read yeah. i think three books uh, during the time I was there, but I started to notice something, which is, you know, I can read very fast, right? So uh, for me, it's uh, very easy to uh, just finish a book in an hour or two, depending on how big it is. Like if it's a really big, thick one, of course, it will take all day. Uh, but uh, I get overwhelmed, right, at some point. Like even if I can technically, physically read it, like I'm starting to notice at some point if I'm learning a lot, there's almost this feeling of like anxiety, like mm -hmm. around learning, right? You're especially if you're learning like new things that you're not familiar with or things that are very like thought provoking. So I find myself wondering, like, how do you manage uh, like the overwhelm you can get when you consume a lot of information very quickly? It's information overload. You have to just be careful not to do it. Even if you can consume fast, doesn't mean you always should. And I and I say that knowing that I'm essentially doing the same thing with this AGI stuff, right? Yeah. Like, I think that's partially why just the other day I was so exhausted and had to just go to sleep because not only was I doing a lot of mental work, building my system out, but I was also doing a lot of learning too. And I don't think I fully yeah. realized until now that I was doing both. I was kind of outputting and inputting at the same time, which is pretty draining. But even just yeah. one or the other, tons of output or tons of inputs, can still be really draining and you also need time to process it. So not only sleep to process it, but even meditation too, like going on a walk, like you're talking about, I realized that I don't sit down and meditate very often. I should do it more. It's a good habit, especially for the brain and the mind, but I do walk. And when I walk, I listen to music or, and or podcasts, but usually music. And in that moment, I can get into a meditative state pretty quickly now, especially since it's a habit stack, but right. it's still one of those things where doing it at the right time after doing a whole bunch of information overload and letting yourself absorb it and take time to process mm. yeah that makes a sense uh, that makes a lot of sense like i think uh one thing i also think does help is note taking because mm. if you can balance out reading with taking notes and also allow yourself to write a lot of notes right because a lot of the time it seems like especially if it's a good book i'll end up having to write a lot about it because mm -hmm. uh, i'll have a lot of reactions to it while i read right so it seems like uh, you need like these kinds of like uh, the problem with the book is you can't really talk with author right so you can't really uh, yell at them if they say something yes. you disagree with right true that's what you're working on right yeah well there's actually that one i'm working on per se but there's other ones out there where so more so podcasts right now, but I'm seeing it for other things. Basically, I, I came across a tool the other day where you just put in all like, you put in all your information, and this you train the bot on your information. Someone's been doing it with their podcasts, so they basically transcribe all their podcasts, put it into ChatGPT, and now this chat bot knows everything about this podcast, and you can ask a question mm -hmm. about this podcast. And the same thing goes for books too. You input a book, and then you can ask questions, interact with that book, which is kind of crazy to think about now. Also, a little yeah. tangent. One plugin I'm really excited for with Obsidian is this like annotation tool because I'm I'm not much of a physical reader even though I have all these books I like more digital books and I can annotate my EPUB books and my PDFs in Obsidian and take notes in Obsidian based off of that which is like oh yes okay that sounds like something I really need um, I can say I'm also looking at and I'm also using uh, a lot of these tools for my own learning process so at the moment I like to learn languages. 
Uh, so I'm learning Spanish. And uh, one thing bueno? I realized you can do. Yeah. Um, uh, needs, uh, need, no bueno. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, I'm, uh, yeah, yo uh, soy Eric, uh, uh, and um, yeah, uh, suddenly I'm blanking out, but I've, I've studied it quite decently. <laughs> I need to practice the chess method, uh, where you basically, a lot of the time I feel like when you're going to a country and you are like, you understand a little bit of the language and uh, you're starting to crack it but you want to start having conversations with people, right? So it seems like what you have to do is almost like the chess method, right? You have to think of it as a set of moves, like you have to plan out, okay, if I go into a conversation, I can say and use these and these and these phrases. And if they respond that, I could say this or this or this. So like that that seems to be the most effective thing if you're like just traveling there for a couple of weeks and you kind of have to just get into talking with people. So it seems like that's very important, but but I do uh, what I'm trying to do as well to uh, learn faster is I'm trying to use chat GDP so mm -hmm. I can talk uh, uh, to chat GDP and it will transcribe it, of course, and send it to chat GDP and uh, then it will reply back to me and basically I'll have it you work as my language tutor. Mm -hmm. So I think that's cool. one way to really use it. Do you also use it for learning in ways like that? Um, I will also just mention Duolingo has been really helpful for language acquisition, but that's a whole other subject. Uh, when it comes to ChatGPT, I haven't really used it for learning. There are some models I've seen out there that have like taken a more nuanced approach to the model and trained it more for learning. Like there's actually like course builders that are automatic because of ChatGPT that teach you a certain topic. I need to find the website. I can't remember off the top of my head, but there's one where you literally just tell it what you want to learn and it'll create like a course for you essentially or like a uh, like a study guide if you will mm. so there are things you can learn with it i have been trying to use it more so in a way of a soundboard so i'm learning but more so for the soundboarding rather than okay i'm gonna actually like kind of like what you're saying with the languages but i was trying to solve a problem with obsidian whereas i had all these ideas for different plugins i was going to use hacked plugins either didn't work or they were too old and didn't work just, or they just like essentially just didn't do what I thought they were going to do, or I couldn't understand them. And so my plan was kind of broken because all the plugins I tried just didn't work. This didn't work for what I needed at least. And so I was like, okay, I need to solve this problem. I need to find an alternative solution. I need to find a repurpose. Like I need to find a plugin and repurpose it for my needs, even though it might not be meant for that. So I was trying to figure mm -hmm. out what I could do, what ways of thinking that could I do. So I was using ChatGPT for that. I even called my aunt to help with that as well. And that's kind of what I've been using to learn. It's like I needed to learn a new way of approach, sort of answering your question, but not really. Yeah, kind of. Uh, like I also use it for programming and troubleshooting and things like that, right? Because it can't program. Like uh, most of the time, the code I will get back is incorrect, but it would show me in the right direction, right? So, uh, and uh, it's a really a back and forth, an iterative process where you kind of like, that's just the kind of what I think uh, we're going to need to do in order to really get to AGI as well. Like mm -hmm. it, it seems like the best way to solve the issue of like incorrect information when it comes to like many of these tools is have them talk to each other's and send things back and forth. And then you can kind of, by comparing what they all say, you can see when something is true or not. Well, and um, one thing to keep in mind is auto GPT and agent GPT. Both of those have been taken this idea of using agents and self-prompting. So the whole auto concept is that it just self-prompts. And instead of you prompting the answer, it does its own. You give it some goals that you want it to do and it'll self-prompt itself until it achieves that goal. And mm -hmm. so it's kind of like what you're saying that was, instead of talking to each other, it's talking to itself, but at least that's still kind of on the same line of thinking. Yeah. Yeah, and there's also like, I still haven't really gotten uh, to setting it up, but private GPT, mm, uh, which I is one that, that you yeah. can train yourself, right? Because yeah. that's kind of what I want to do. Like I want to just feed it all my data uh, mm -hmm. because it's my private GPT and so it's not shared with chat GPT and uh, use it as a personal memory bank, right? To keep up uh, all the thousands of uh, pages that are written, all the YouTube videos, just compile all the transcripts and everything in one place, right? Right. That's exactly what I've been trying to do with uh, some of the plugins for Obsidian too, but those are not so much private. One of them I think is, but out of the 12, only one is private. That's not really safe. 
Yeah, the plugins, of course, allow them to make the money through sharing the data somehow and selling it somehow. They, uh, they hope they can use it somehow. <laughs> I, I don't think they're selling data. It's just the fact that they're sending it to OpenAI's API. And so- Yeah, to like, train and, it as well. Yeah, that's, that's yeah. how they work. Is, is, so it's not really the plugins fault. It's more just OpenAI not being trustworthy as much. Yeah, I also had this moment uh, last week where somebody asked me for a quote from Carl Jung, and I knew mm -hmm. what the quote was to an extent, but I couldn't know where I got it from because he's written, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, a lot of books. <laughs> uh, so basically what I did was I sent them links to all his YouTube interviews, uh, and I had it look through all the transcripts and find something that sounded like that quote. And it was able to find the quote and where it was so I could, you know, could look it back up. I will also say too, the power of a knowledge management system isn't just how it connects to each other, but how easily you are able to retrieve information. And I think that's yeah. one potential help that these GPT tools and these AI tools can help you with is helping you retrieve information more effectively. Because essentially it's indexing all of your files and learning from them. And that's yeah. why I love that idea because it helps you interact with your content more. You might have a great organized system, but if you can't retrieve the information you need, especially in a timely manner, that can be an issue. I think that's what, uh, honestly, I think everyone should aspire to as well when it comes to being a polymath and when it comes mm -hmm. to learning a lot as well, because I have wanted to learn everything about everything since I was a kid. And I've been studying very hard and learning a lot and reading a lot, but you know, there is no way I'd be able to learn the sum total of all human knowledge and everything else uh, <laughs> like uh, by hand, by reading it through it, one word by a uh, word, right? But uh, if you can learn how to find information and uh, how to navigate all the information in the world, mm -hmm. I think you're already pretty good in the way. Like if you know where to look and about the main principles and how it works and how it fits together, like I think that might be the answer. I think you're very, what you said there was very astute and we definitely need to touch on that. But one thing I want to mention, because it keeps coming to mind, is that there's a difference between polymath and renaissance person. And people think that polymathy is like knowing everything. But that was more of what the Renaissance person was. At that time, theoretically, you could know everything because there wasn't mm -hmm. as much to know at that time, at least. And even then, I would still say it's kind of rare to know everything because not every polymath of the Italian or Arabian Renaissances knew everything. But like Da Vinci, you could say did, right? But knowing everything back then, again, that's kind of a gray area. We can put that off to the side. Nowadays, obviously, information is so widely vast and so many different top subjects and, you know, merged subjects like biotechnology and stuff like that or nanotechnology. That kind of stuff, you can't know everything. It's just impossible. And even if you are an expert in that field, everything changes so fast. We learn so much information about every subject that even if you were the expert in so many different areas, you or even just one, you can't know everything about that subject because it just changes so much. So even if you were able to know everything, you couldn't keep up with every new innovation and idea that's come out or in hypothesis and theories. Yeah. And I actually use that as a example in my multidisciplinary spectrum because the, the beginning is a multi-potential life. You have the potential to do many different things. Great. And you become a specialist or generalist, that kind of thing. But on the opposite end of the spectrum, I call it an omnimath. And I, I've used, someone else came up with that idea too. So it's not just I came up with it, but I use it because it's it's omni, meaning all. Poly means much or many, many areas of expertise. Omni meaning all. That's kind of like a conceptual end of the point where you know everything. But even if you are immortal, you couldn't get to that point because of change. Just thought that was a yeah. cool concept to share. I actually really like that word, omni math, that I think uh, it's uh, indeed like impossible to think about or conceive a uh, person being. But the, in the same way, like we're, I think, because we have learned so much and accumulated so much knowledge in the modern world, I think there's also like a greater pressure on people to specialize, right? So it's because we realize it's going to be impossible to learn um, some uh, a lot of the information. So it's best that people just choose one discipline and then they stick to that. But what we're ending up with in a way is like we're ending up with like uh, people that know their piece of the pie, but nobody mm. really seems to know and understand how the whole works anymore, right? So I'm very interested in politics and like, how do we build an effective system that mm -hmm. everyone on the planet can live with and use? And I think like the only way to get there is uh, if we can create a group of people or like if we can become people that know 
and understand how different systems intersect and integrate and work together. Well, and the thing is too, it's not that knowing just one subject is better. We think that because of societal norms, but that's only because of the industrial revolution, the second industrial revolution. That's the mentality we've had as society for the past hundred years, but that's not how it was before that. And it's not how it really is now either with this whole internet revolution that we are in now, the fourth industrial revolution, if you want to call it that, because um, that's what the book calls it. It's mm -hmm. interesting how being a journalist is actually more, makes you more successful. You're not a specialist. You're not someone who's just one expertise. You have hobbies, you have other knowledge areas. You may not count those as your expertise, but other people would. If you know much more than a layperson, then you're gonna be perceived more so as an expert than anyone else. I think there's just this dissonance based on how we think about specialists and generalists. And a lot of people are biased by some of that societal norm from a hundred years ago. And yeah. it's a hundred years old. That's the thing, it's a hundred years old. People don't realize that. I uh, think that we can definitely call what we're facing now like a uh, fourth in a new industrial revolution in many ways. So I think it's, it's a good like, book. You should look it up, actually. Yeah, I'd love to read it and look at it. it sounds really interesting. Um, very interesting the history of ideas and how those things evolve, right? Uh, I think like you're absolutely on point. Like uh, I think we want to believe that you know uh if you special like everyone's a specialist in one area right we want it to be like easy in a sense to say okay that person does this and that person does that and that person does this and like they have those roles and we often tend to assume that you know if a person is good in that field they're not going to be good in that field and if they are have worked in that direction or area they're not going to be able to do that area or that area right but i think you know, if you look at it in uh how things really seem to work like uh we can definitely see that you know uh the more people apply themselves and uh, study and learn and challenge themselves and grow and like the less limitations people set for themselves the better like if people can be free to explore and like try to out different things like and learn multiple disciplines they seem to generally fare better in life in general mm -hmm. well especially that's what entrepreneurs do for example but i think what you were saying there before is that we we think of someone as just one thing my theory is that it's more just a bias that we have. Like we would have, you know, everyone has like racial biases and everyone has different stereotypical biases. And those are biases we have to overcome as a person in order to become a better person when it comes to any kind of situation socially. And I think that the same thing goes for specialties too. These are biases that we have been pushed through through society, like I said, and there's something that we can overcome. We don't have to think that way. I think that over time we actually are seeing a change in that. So I think that's a um, that's a whole share... rabbit hole we could probably say quick from. <laughs> yeah, no, it's uh, true. So I uh, wanted to say, do you have uh, what is the weirdest rabbit hole that you've ever gone down? Mm. The first thing that really comes to mind is ambient lighting, and so yeah. I was always really enamored with this idea of immersive gaming. I've always been a video gamer. You know, VR is always super cool. I was. I was from the like early bleeding edge when it came to like looking into the Oculus Rift back in the day. And around that time, there was a lot of motion controllers and ambient lighting. So maybe motion controllers is the better one. And I was trying to find what are some interesting ways that I could immerse myself in a game. So having a motion control or having lighting behind your display, allowing it to change. So if you're in the desert, the light behind your display will turn yellow. If you're in the ocean subnautica, it'll be blue around you. And that helps your eyes not strain as much and also immerse itself. So if your screen's only this big, but the lighting beyond that helps kind of alleviate that tension between the dark and light background. And so it actually immerses you more in the game. And I spent a lot of time learning about ambient lighting way before Philips Hue became really a thing. Like it had just came out, I think, at that point in time, and it was just the bulb that was it. But before that, Philips actually had their AMBX, AMB, or uh, AMFX, something like that, little speakers that had little ambient lighting bulbs at the top. This was back in like 20, 2006, something like that. It was fascinating how just simple of the technology it is. And nowadays it's so much common. People have these lighting strips behind their TVs and stuff like that. But back in the day, it was yeah. such a nerdy thing. Yeah, that's, uh, I, my TV had that as well. And I could notice that I actually really liked it. I actually really enjoyed it. I, it was like a big, uh, quality upgrade to have that uh, when I got there a couple of years ago. Um, do you have like a topic that you feel like you're going to continue to study for the rest of your life? Mm, philosophy? I know that's kind of a cheap answer, but it's one thing that 
I know a lot about philosophy. I spent a lot of time in high school learning about it. I'm sure you could understand completely what I mean by that. Like there's this, if you're mm. interested in something, you're going to go down those rabbit holes. One of my favorite stories to tell is that when I was a junior in high school, so probably the second to last year, right? I burned through my high school library's philosophy and world religion section, like in a matter of a few months. I skipped some books, obviously, yeah. but I went through every main title that was in that section that was interesting. So from Aristotle to the Dalai Lama to, you know, this Taoism, anything that I could pick up on. And I learned a lot. I got a college level of philosophy education just from that alone, let alone since then, all the different things I've learned from. And just like this book that I talked about to you last night, the Dao Physics, it's interesting that like these different things that you'll understand in a certain way when you're young, but as you get older, you'll understand it differently. And I think that always going to be something I'm going to be digging into. Yeah, I was going to say that's my answer too. <laughs> like yeah. that's definitely like I've been studying that since I was a kid and I'm going to continue yeah. to study that for the rest of my life. And I was also realizing that uh, because I think philosophy is one of the most dangerous things you can study as a person because it's one of those studies where, you know, okay, if you study physics or mm -hmm. natural sciences, like you're going to learn interesting stuff by doing it. But if you study philosophy and you come mm -hmm. across a certain idea that is so powerful, that can really just transform your entire life in a day, right? So if you just take that and understand that and go like, huh, <laughs> like it, that can really just change. Uh, like for me, like I, I've gone through these shifts where it's been like I've uncovered something in philosophy. And like, because I understood that, suddenly I had to change everything about what I did and how well, I did it. And just imagine like, and some people stop at certain, like they say they read two or three different philosophy texts, like let's say the, the uh, you know, what's it called? The Cimmerian or maybe the Book of Confucius or the Tao Te Ching or Aristotle's text. And they, they read just one area, one subject, and then they do the next one, the next one, then they stop. And that's all they've consumed all their entire life are those three philosophical, philosophical areas. The Bible, for example, is one of them too. They only stop yeah. at just one or two texts versus you or I when we keep reading different texts and different areas of philosophy we keep getting one or two of those snippets that change our life and it starts to compound and one thing i was going to mention too that i probably will never stop studying is the bridge the balance between science and philosophy mm. oh, i hope That's... that didn't offend people because i didn't realize what i just did there but yeah science and philosophy. <laughs> right so but i'm curious what you mean uh with the bridge between science and philosophy like how do you what do you what are you considering here the book I just mentioned too, that Tao Physics is a good example, but how quantum mechanics relates to Buddhism and for example, it's just, it's, I can't explain it simply, so I don't understand it well enough, but I do understand that the fact that a lot of Buddhism talk about the low hum, the middle hum, the middle path, right? Not going too high, not going too low, finding that middle ground, that, that just, that solid hum of life, understanding that it is a balance between the highs and the lows and just trying to find that wave same thing happens with quantum mechanics too where everything is vibrations it's everything is down to the minute details little strings are just vibrations even the things we think as physical the atoms are just combinations of vibrations they're not actually physical it's crazy to think about how both of those relate together how the vibrations of the atoms can also relate on a slightly bigger scale of the buddhism concept as well yeah I uh, just finished like recording like uh, one hour on alchemy, um, Jungian alchemy, like just discussing Jung's ideas and alchemy and how they looked at it. And I think it's very relevant here because uh, what I came to realize from studying alchemy was that uh, everything seems to be interrelated, right? So mm. uh, if you look at something on a macro level and compare it to a micro level, you can see like the, there are traces, like everything seems to be leading from one source, right? So everything seems to be following similar pattern. And if you understand the pattern, you can understand anything. Like that seems to be the case. Like if you start studying Buddhism and then you start applying those ideas to understand natural sciences, like that's one thing a lot of Buddhists say that Buddhism is extremely science compatible, right? It's uh, they because they will take whatever they're learning uh, in uh, the sciences and they'll be like, oh yeah, we have a term for that in Buddhism. <laughs> like we we tend to say the same thing. So somehow like they've been able to meditate them their way to like a lot of this insight. Like so they've, yeah. they've just through this process of just meditation, it seems like they've been able to learn a lot about well, the world. And that reminded me of a conversation that the Dalai Lama had with. Paul Ekman, where basically this is the balance between 
the science and philosophy, emotional intelligence and philosophy, and how both of those interrelate. And so the, the lessons that Carl Ekman, who is a leading like expert in emotional intelligence and microexpressions that he had with the Dalai Lama, they had different approaches, but the same answer. And it's just interesting how the how and the why combined into the what. And so, yeah, like that's what you're, like you're saying, there's this kind of the unification of that. Exactly, exactly. Honestly, this has been a fascinating conversation and uh, I would love to talk to you again and uh, discover more about this in the future. So mm -hmm. if you want to see Dustin on the channel again uh, or uh, just let me leave a comment. And uh, yeah, I wanted to ask you uh, to wrap this up a little bit. Like, do you have any specific podcasts or uh, so that you think would be really interesting for our viewers to enjoy this conversation on your channel? What do you mean on my channel? Like on your podcast, do you have any specific episodes that you think would be particularly interesting for people that yeah. are interested in uh, 16 personalities and learning and polymaths? Leon Shao's episode, where he is one of my guests who talked a lot about personalities and that kind of thing. And I think that his episode in particular would be good. I can send you a link, you can leave it in the description. Sounds great. Sounds great. Um, the, do you have like any last words or anything you'd like to bring up? My main philosophy in life is balance. And while that might be originated from perhaps like a Buddhist kind of concept I absorbed when I was a kid, it's also something that I've noticed throughout my life and finding that balance in everything. And I, and I mean that in everything, whether it's philosophy and technology or philosophy and science, or just even just in your life too, when it comes to introversion versus extroversion, that kind of personality balance. I find mm -hmm. that the journey to finding that balance is the most important part of my life. And I feel like for you as well, the listeners, I think that's essentially important to your life as well. Yeah, I will say the same. Like uh, when I was a kid, my first, I, I actually wrote my own philosophical theory, right? So uh, after reading everything and consuming it all, I was like, I think I figured it out. Uh, I was like 12 years old at a time. So I wrote uh, the balance theory or the line mm -hmm. theory. And uh, basically, I was just showing how like different ideas seem to depend on each other, and how like what looks like to be opposites and incompatibilities often seem to need each other's and fit together perfectly. So opposites like, attract. It seems to be that that opposites attract. Carl Jung was a big fan of the idea that like that's how you attain flow, right? Mm -hmm. To him, that was like by uh, flow and psychic energy comes from like the ability for people to facilitate the motion from one area to another right for example mm -hmm. for me it's like uh spending a lot of time in introspection and reflection about things and research and a lot of time going out and creating content and sharing ideas like this kind of pendulum where you swing back and forth between like these two extremes that seems to be what seems to create the space of balance and integration where it seems like uh, if i do that like i can be in the state of flow all the time almost yeah eric did you publish that balance theory i did never publish it i on your still blog. have it somewhere <laughs> maybe i should i'll uh, try to look it up when i'm in sweden again uh <laughs> so thank you again uh, for joining in uh, it was a pleasure talking to you and uh yeah i uh, hope uh, to see you again in another video thank you for having me eric thanks so yeah that's basically it i can pause the recording it might be helpful to just do two recordings too that way, at least they're like still separate. I don't know. I have to go to the bathroom anyways. I'll be right back. Yeah, no problem. I'll, I'll do the same. <laughs>